Blessed be the name of the Lord. Good morning. I thank God Almighty for this wonderful day. I'm much delighted as the service becomes a witness of our unity and oneness today. Our beloved Abraham Vagi Sachin, the vicar of the Emmanuel Mathama Church, is celebrating the communion today. I'm very happy for his presence and leadership in spite of all his busy schedule this day. I welcome Achin into our midst. I also acknowledge the presence of respected women Samuel Achin here and also Philip, Philip Achin. A good number of youth from different Mathuma parishes of the Southwest region and their parents and friends are also part participating in this communion. A very warm welcome to all our distinguished guests today. As today is a continuation of the sports tournament events and also as we observe the day as the students and day we have a representative from the young generation sharing the word of God with us. Today's preacher, Mr. J. V. Matthew, is a member of the Trinity Mathuma Church and son of Mr. Matthew Burgess and Mrs. Amini V. Matthew. J. currently does his MD in expository preaching from the Dallas Theological Seminary. He is an eloquent speaker of the word of God as well as a very able musician and involves very sincerely in the ministries of the church in Houston and other areas. It's heartwarming to see youngsters like Jay rise up with the word of God and unashamedly witnessing to the good news revealed through Jesus Christ. I hope more will be inspired by the love of God to take up the task of announcing the kingdom of God to the world from among our wife of members in the days to come. With a lot of love and sincere prayers, I request J.B. Matthew to come and share the word of God with us. church. It always feels good to be home. First of all, praise God for another opportunity that he has provided for me uh, to stand before the people of God with the word of God this morning. Thank you to the Utchins for this invitation and the leadership of the church for this invitation. As you guys can see, it's a packed house this morning, right? There's a lot of people here this morning. And why is it that we have so many people here this morning? Sports tournament, right? Wrong. See, you might think that this weekend is an important weekend because of the Southwest Regional Youth Fellowship Sports Tournament, but God wants you to know that this weekend is going to be one of the most important weekends in your life because of what he's going to speak to you through his word this morning. For some of y'all, tournament is more important than Christmas, right? You've been waiting all year for August 10th through 12th so you could come play at sports tournament, so you could come finally talk to that boy, finally ask that girl for her number, finally hang out with your friends. Some of you probably didn't even want to come here this morning because your team lost, and why would we want to worship Jesus if our team lost? Or maybe some of you didn't want to come here this morning, but your ride, the church van, came this morning. Or maybe you're only here because you have to claim your trophy after church. 
But regardless of the reason why you think you came here this morning, God allowed you to be here this morning because he wants to speak to you. He wants to change your heart, and he wants to transform your life. So let's get excited and brace ourselves for what God has for us this morning. Amen? If you could turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel according to Matthew. This is the passage that Upchin read for us during our Gospel portion reading time. The Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 6. We're going to be focusing primarily in verses 25 to 34. Matthew 6, verses 25 to 34. Before we get to work, let's pause for a moment of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time, this God-ordained time that you've allowed us to come into your house, to sing praises to you, to fellowship with one another, and now to spend some time before your holy word, Father. I pray that your word will be used this morning to draw the hearts of many men and women to you. Father, I pray that your word will be used this morning to soften hardened hearts, to encourage broken spirits, to revive complacent lives, Father. Father, I pray for the people who are gathered here this morning, Father. I pray that you protect them from any attack of the enemy that tries to distract them, but that this entire time, their focus, their attention will be completely on your voice this morning. Father, I pray for myself. You know how weak I am. You know how sinful I am. You know how discouraged I am. But Father, I pray that you cleanse me this morning. Let nothing in my life stand in the way of your blessing this morning. Father, I pray that you encourage me, that you empower me by the power of your Holy Spirit. Pour more of your Spirit in me so he can pour out of me and speak to your people this morning. Father, above all else, I pray that no one gets an ounce of glory that you deserve this morning. I do not want people leaving here this place saying, what an amazing sermon, what an amazing speaker, what an amazing worship set. No, Lord, I want people going out to this lost world and declaring, what an amazing Jesus. It's in his name, and by the power of your spirit we pray, and all God's people said, amen and amen. For those of you who know me well by now, you know that no matter how old I get, my favorite movie of all time is The Lion King. You also know that I love to quote The Lion King in my sermons, okay? So in this movie, there's a scene where Simba has run away from home. His dad, Mufasa, has just been killed. And Simba has been lied to by his uncle Scar that Simba is the reason why Mufasa is dead. So Simba runs away, never to return. And he's rescued by two animals, Timon and Pumbaa. Timon and Pumbaa are two carefree, fun-loving animals, and when they rescue Simba, they can see something's wrong with him, that he's upset, that he's burdened, that he's full of pain and sorrow, worry and anxiety. And they use two powerful words to encourage their new friend, Hakuna Matata. <laughs> Hakuna Matata. It means no worries for the rest of your days. This morning, God wants to use his powerful word to encourage his people of that same truth. No worries for the rest of your days. Now, listen to me loud and clear. I am not saying, God is not saying, no more problems, no more trials, no more struggles, no more difficulties. I'm not one of those false teachers who will stand up here and lie to you with a Kool-Aid smile on my face and say, God just wants to bless you and make you so happy and give you anything you ask for and give you the best life now. Don't be fooled by that smile. They're not that happy either. Trust me. They just got a great dentist, okay? <laughs> If you're a born-again believer, the Word of God guarantees more problems, more struggles, more trials, more difficulties for the rest of your days. What I am saying that God is saying is no more worries for the rest of your days. In 2018, Christians in America are wrestling with worry more than any other place in the world. The most affluent society in the world is the most worry-filled society in the world. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and you're filled with worry. You're worried about your life. You're worried about your health. You're worried about 
getting into a school. You're worried about graduating from school. You're worried about finding a job after school. You're worried about your finances. You're worried about finding a significant other. You're worried about getting married. You're worried about your marriage crumbling. You're worried about your children, your grandchildren, your parents. You're worried about terrorism and security. Maybe you're worried about social security. Maybe you come from a long family line of warriors, and that shouldn't surprise us considering all the blood pressure issues we have in the Indian culture. But this morning, from Matthew 6, Six, God is going to powerfully show you that no matter what you are sitting in the house of the Lord worried about this morning, you can walk out of this place saying, Hakuna Matata, embracing the reality of no more worries for the rest of your days. Let's look at our passage, Matthew chapter 6. First of all, what's the context of our passage? Obviously, our passage is written by a man named Matthew. He was originally a tax collector who left that job and became one of the 12 disciples of Jesus. Now, the book of Matthew is one of the four Gospels in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All four of these books have one purpose, to point people to the good news of Jesus Christ. But each of these authors in each of these books has a different theme. Matthew is writing primarily to a Jewish audience and focusing on the fact that Jesus is the king that the Jews had been waiting for. So every passage in the entire book of Matthew points back to the good news that Jesus is king. In Matthew chapter 4, King Jesus kicks off a public ministry, a teaching, preaching, and healing ministry that grabs the attention of crowds and crowds of people who are flocking to him. Flip over one chapter earlier to Matthew chapter 5. Because in Matthew chapter 5, King Jesus is kicking off a three-chapter sermon known famously as the Sermon on the Mount. But look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Seeing the crowds, he went up onto a mountain, and after he had sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them. So the Sermon on the Mount was not being preached by Jesus to the crowds and crowds of people who were flocking to him. It was a sermon specifically for his disciples. King Jesus is teaching the citizens of his kingdom or his disciples about the kingdom of God. Our passage this morning from Matthew 6 comes from the Sermon on the Mount. So this morning's sermon only applies to you if you're a committed disciple of Jesus. Let's get to work. Matthew 6, verse 25. Jesus starts off by saying, Therefore I tell you, do not worry. This was not a suggestion. This was not a recommendation. This was a powerful command. And it was obviously a very important to, uh, command to Jesus because three times in our passage, he repeats this command. Verse 25, verse 31, verse 34, he says, do not worry. So if Jesus is commanding his disciples not to worry, then when a disciple of Jesus worries, he or she is committing a sin. Disobedience to a command of Jesus is a sin, right? Nah, Jay, worry is not a sin. That's just something that comes naturally for all of us. You're right. It is natural. God always commands us to do something contrary to our natural sinful self because it forces, on us, it forces us to rely completely on him to even obey it. Worry is a sin. And just like any other sin and every other sin, it's a disease that is plaguing and disabling many of us seated here this morning. In Matthew 6... Jesus begins by laying out the symptoms of this disease called worry. If you went to WebMD.com right now, this is what Jesus would have posted as the three symptoms for worry. First of all, worry is unwise. Worry is unwise. Look at verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Scroll down to verses 28 to 30. And why do you worry about clothes, Jesus asks? 
Look at how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was clothed like one of these. If this is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Okay. Jesus is asking his disciples back then and asking his disciples today, if you believe that God is the one who created you, he's the one who provided you with a life, why do you worry that he won't provide for that life? That's foolish. Because the more difficult thing for God to do was to create you, to give you a life, and he did that. I'm going to take it a step further. Everyone in here would agree that God is sufficient to provide us with eternal life. So when a Christian worries, you are looking at the face of God and saying, God, I trust you to save me. I trust you to redeem me. I trust you to break the chains of Satan off of me, to take me from hell to heaven, to give me eternal life. I just don't think you could get me through the next couple of days. You're worried about resources, but God has made you alive. You're worried about clothing, but guess what? God gave you arms to put through those sleeves. Nobody likes being called a fool, especially not by Jesus. But Jesus is very clear that worry is for the fool. It is unwise. Secondly, Jesus says that worry is unproductive unproductive. Look at verse 27. Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? The original text says add a cubit to your stature, which was a metaphor used back then for adding length of days to a person's life. Jesus is asking you this morning the same question. How many of you, seated in the house of God, by worrying, has added a single hour to your life? Worry never adds anything to your life. It only takes away from your life. It takes away years from your life. It takes away joy from your life. It takes away peace from your life. It takes away hair from your life. <laughs> See, my mom, she thinks it's the lack of um, using oil. Wait, wait, what is it? Datri. Okay? She thinks, like, if I just drench my hair in that, it's going to be like a chia pet, and it's like, woo! But... No, that's not the problem. Sorry, mommy. I'm going to hear about that when I get home. (laughs) Worry is unproductive. It only takes away. Now you think, well, Jesus was able to say that back then, but what about today? Let me tell you how unproductive worry is today. Statistics show that 40% of the things we worry about don't even happen. 30% of the things we worry about are things in the past that can't even be changed. 12% of the things we worry about are imaginary criticisms that we think other people have about us that aren't even true. And 10% of the things we worry about are health issues that actually end up getting worse when we worry. So a grand total of 92% of the things we worry about don't even happen or can't even be changed. Trust me, Jesus knew what he was talking about when he said, worry is unproductive. But not only is worry unwise, not only is worry unproductive, worry is unchristian. Whoa there, Jay, that's a little too far. Calm down now. Not my word. His words. Look at verse 32. Jesus says that worry is for the who? The pagan. For Jesus to associate worry with a pagan as he's preaching primarily to a Jewish audience was a radical statement. A pagan is someone who believes in and worships false gods. They do not believe in and worship the one true God. Jesus is saying that when we worry, we are taking part in an activity, a sin that is set apart for a person who doesn't even believe in God, a pagan. Now, why would Jesus say such a radical statement like this? What is so different about a Christian and a pagan that makes worry something that only a pagan should do? First of all, we serve different masters. 
Now I want you to pay attention to something huge. Don't miss this, don't miss this, don't miss this. Scroll back up to verse 25. In verse 25, Jesus starts off by saying, therefore, I tell you, do not worry. Anytime you study the Bible and you see the word therefore, pause and pay attention because it is an adverb connecting the present thought with the previous thought. What's the previous thought? Scroll up to verse 24, Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate the one or love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. Okay, let's do some defining here. Worry is not the same thing as concern. Jesus has never commanded his disciples not to be concerned. Concern is... I have an issue in my life that is troubling me, and I'm setting forth a plan to address it. Worry is concern on steroids. Worry is when the concern controls you. It controls your thoughts. It controls your emotions. It controls your inability to sleep, your inability to function. In fact, the Greek word that Jesus uses here for worry means to be torn in two. See, Jesus is connecting the sin of worry in verse 25 back to his command in verse 24 not to serve two masters. A master is someone who tells you what to do. He controls you. He owns you. When you worry, it owns you. It controls you. It has now become your master. This morning, church, Jesus is saying, when you worry, you are acting like a pagan, a non-believer, a non-Christian who is living a life torn between serving two masters. But if you are a Christian, if you are a born-again believer, you could only have, you could only serve one master, and he is God Almighty, and he he alone tells you what to do. He alone owns you because he purchased you with the blood of his son, Jesus, and he alone has full control over your life. We serve different masters. But a Christian and a pagan are also different because we have different fathers. In verse 32, he continues, and your heavenly father knows that you need them. Who's a pagan's father? A pagan, a, a non-believer, a person who has never trusted by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone to redeem their life, they still belong to the family of Satan. Satan is their father. But for a Christian who has been adopted into the family of God, you now have a new father, a heavenly father who knows what you need, not what you really, really want. Not what you think you really, really need. He knows what you need. Jesus is saying, God the Father loved you so much that he gave his son to die for you. Not for the birds of the air, not for the lilies of the field, but for you because he's your father. This morning, Jesus is saying, when you worry, you have forgotten who you are and whose you are. When you worry, you are looking to the face of God and saying, you are not the father. Church, this morning, Jesus is asking you, who's your daddy? Is it the loving Heavenly Father who knows what you need, or are you sitting here this morning still calling Satan daddy? Jesus is clear. Worry is unchristian. Now, we've seen the symptoms of worry. What about the cure? A lot of times when we wrestle with worry, we turn to worldly cures whether it's money, whether it's substances, pleasures, people. I've learned that even Christians can give you ineffective cures. There's some Christians, when you're worried, they'll come to you, and you know what their advice is? Just stop. Just stop worrying. All you have to do is just speak it. Just keep declaring it. I am not worried. I am not worried. I am not worried. And eventually, you'll end up believing it. Please don't fall for that. That is not a biblical cure. That's a cure from a TED Talk. And all that is is a band-aid that will come off real quick. Now, there's other Christians who want to make sure you're as worried as they are so that they can feel better about what they're worried about, right? Like, if you're not worried, they'll come to you and say, wait, you're not worried about that? 
You should really be more worried about that man because that really sucks. And they'll continue to rehearse your situation over and over and over and over again with you until they lead you into the sin of worry because misery loves company, right? These cures will fail you. These cures are ineffective. But the great thing about the great physician Jesus is not only does he educate us about the symptoms of this disease called worry, he provides us with a cure. In Matthew 6, he tells us two things we must do to cure this sin of worry in our life. First of all, he says, live for the kingdom of God. Verse 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Jesus is saying that the cure for worry begins with seeking. Seeking what? His kingdom and his righteousness, meaning his authority and standards must rule completely over every area of my life. Where do I find that? The word of God. Why? Because the word of God points back to the son of God who is the king of kings in the kingdom of God. And all of that must be first in your life. On your long list of priorities, what number is pursuing Jesus? Is he at the bottom? somewhere in the middle? Or do you feel really, really good about yourself because Jesus is in my top five? Let me tell you what we've done with Jesus. It's like all of us sitting here go to Six Flags and show up at this one roller coaster that we all want to get on, right? So we get to this roller coaster, and when we get there, there's only one person standing there, Jesus. We look at him, we smile at him, we say, what's up to him? And then we start ignoring him. And we start pushing him back, 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 all the way to the back of the line. And we're all standing there in line, so hyped to get on this roller coaster, but nothing's happening. Nobody's moving. We're just waiting for someone to let us get on the ride and start the ride, and we don't even realize that the person we kick to the back of the line is the ride operator. See, Jesus is the only one who could operate that ride. Jesus is the only one who will let you get on that ride. He's the only one who will check to see if you're too short to get on that ride. He's the only one who will make sure you are safely and securely buckled in. Jesus is the only one in total and complete control of a roller, co- of a roller coaster called life. But we have kicked him to the back of the line. This morning, church, Jesus is saying, if you will put him and his kingdom and his righteousness back in his rightful place, you can walk out of here with no more worries for the rest of your days. Live for the kingdom of God first. Finally, he says, live for the present day. Verse 34, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Most people are stuck between worrying about yesterday and about tomorrow. Maybe you're worried about your yesterday. You're worried about your past. Maybe it's a past sin. This morning, God is reminding you, why are you remembering your past sin when he has cast them to the bottom of the ocean floor? Maybe you're worried about a past sorrow, and he's reminding you that his word says, not that you will walk to, not that you will walk in, but that you will walk through the valley of the shadow of death because he is with you. Close the door on yesterday because yesterday is gone and done, and you can't make it undone. Maybe you're worried about your tomorrow. And Jesus says in verse 34, don't worry about your tomorrow. Why? Because each day has enough trouble of its own. When you waste time and energy worrying about what might happen tomorrow, it leaves you with no energy to deal with the issues of today. Think about it this way, okay? This is real tough, okay? This is like some high-level thinking stuff right here. Today is the tomorrow you were worried about yesterday. Yesterday, you were worried about your tomorrow, but you're making it today, even though you worried about it, 
yesterday. Guess what? The Bible says in Lamentations 3, verse 23, that his mercies are new every morning. So stop trying to get some of tomorrow's mercy today. The mercy you need for tomorrow, God will give you tomorrow. Guess what? Church, you have something to praise him for today. God has been gracious to you today. God has been merciful to you today. God has been sufficient for you today. God has been faithful in your life today. You might be unsure about your tomorrow. You might be unsure about your future but today is the day that the Lord has made. So how about you rejoice and be glad in it? Jesus says, you can cure the sin of worry if you will live for the kingdom of God and live in the present day. Now, you've heard all that and you say, Jay, that's all good in the neighborhood, but what do I do when I'm tempted to worry? Because like I said earlier, more problems, more trials, more struggles, more difficulties for the rest of your days. So what do I do when I'm tempted to worry? View every temptation to worry as a personal invitation from God to pray. View every temptation to worry as a personal invitation from God to pray. Whenever you are going through a difficulty that causes you or tempts you to worry, I want you to stop what you're doing. I don't care what it is. Stop what you're doing and immediately start having a conversation with your father. Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, do not worry about anything, but pray about everything. But Jay, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I'm going through. You don't know about this incurable health disease in my life. You don't know how I'm struggling in my health. You don't know how I'm struggling in school. You don't know how I'm struggling to find a job. You don't know how I'm struggling in my career. You don't know about my financial burdens. You don't know how I've been looking so long for a significant other. You don't know how long I've been trying to get married. You don't know how my marriage is on the rocks. You don't know how rebellious my children are. You don't know about about my struggles. You don't know about my loneliness. You don't know about my rejection. You don't know about my addictions. You don't know about my failures. You don't know, Jay. <laughs> You're right. Jay Matthew does not know. But guess what? You have a high priest who does. You have a high priest who is able to sympathize with you in your weaknesses. You have a high priest who is waiting at the right hand of the Father to take your need to the throne of grace and act on your behalf. And this morning, church, your high priest, King Jesus, is commanding you, do not worry. Stop turning your worry inward and start turning your worry upward in prayer to him. Because when you do, you will move from being a sinful warrior and start becoming a prayerful warrior. And you can walk out of those doors today with no worries for the rest of your days. So we've come to the close of our time this morning. God wants to extend an invitation to you. If you're sitting here this morning, and God has clearly spoken to you, convicted you of the sin of worry in your life, and you desire to respond in surrender and obedience to what you've heard from his word this morning, God wants you to stand up in your seat right now. And please be honest, don't stand up because, oh, well, other people around me are standing up, or uh, I hope I won't bother Jay if I don't. St I don't care. This is not my invitation. This is God's invitation. But if God has spoken to you this morning, convicted you of the sin of worry, would you please rise to your feet? And as you rise to your feet, let us join together and submit ourselves to the throne of grace. That from this moment on, we will not be a people who will fall for the temptation of worry that Satan throws in our life, but we, by the power of the Holy Spirit, will live not a problem-free, trial-free, struggle-free, difficulty-free life, but a worry-free life. And as many of you have stood to your feet, let us dedicate our lives to the throne of grace. Let us, as one church, as one body, with one voice, join together and declare in this place, What a friend we have in Jesus. Oh, 
our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? It shall never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we Find who will all our sorrow share? Jesus knows our every and shield thee. Thou will find a solid. Keeping in mind everything that God has spoken to us from his word this morning, if one of you can submit us to the throne of grace by closing us with the word of prayer.
Yeah, man. 